We're very lucky to be joined with some real experts within the area of higher education and student mental health with us today. So we've already heard from Paul Farmer. Um, we have Professor Peter Francis from Northumbria University, Professor Mary Stewart from the Vice Chancellor from Lincoln University, and we have Rosie Tressler with us today, the CEO of Student Minds. So, Rosie, would you like to go first and introduce yeah, kind of. Um, hi everyone, um, and just to reiterate what others have said, um, it's really a pleasure to be here, and um, even though we are now in Perda, um, I think there's an agreement that we just don't want to do some of that speaking truth to power as we go through this panel, so I hope people are going to get stuck in and ask some good questions. Um, I think, uh, just to give a bit of background, I, I, I'd like to start by just saying how much I love universities. Um, so, probably like a lot of you in, in this audience, a lot of people in this sector, you know, stay in it because they believe in the transformation that can go on for somebody that goes through university higher education. Um, and part of why, for the last decade, um, myself and the colleagues at Student Minds have been focused on this is because we really do believe that universities contribute so much to society and can help solve some of the biggest challenges. Um, so that's a really big driver for us. And it's because of that that I also think it's really important that we keep challenging ourselves to do better. Um, we've kind of taken a few approaches to that, and I suppose part of that has come from very much driven from the ground up and from students themselves. So the charity grew out of a group of students getting in a room together and listening to each other. Really simply listening, really listening, <laughs> actually listening, um, and seeking to really understand what was going on for them, their experiences, some of the blocks and barriers um, along the way. Today we're split across three key areas, so we focus on student-led approaches to mental health, so some of that is around peer support, the value, which I think Paul really highlighted in the video, um, the natural net, sort of networks of support around an individual, um, but also movement building, so actually recognising that in our communities, students can and should be empowered to really understand what's going on locally and be a, be a core part of that change. Um, but on the second level we work at is much more on support for the sector. So um, as Nicola highlighted earlier, we're really delighted to be um, developing the University Mental Health Charter. But we also have work going on with students' unions and with um, the student accommodation sector, recognising that all organisations that interact with students have a part to play. And then finally, we are undertaking work that looks at the research gaps um, that exist in student mental health, so uh, with a partner in SMARTM that Katie mentioned, um, looking at what are some of those health inequalities, what are those gaps that, that we need to fill. Um, so I guess across all of those things, it means we do get a really good sense of what are some of these key challenges, what, what do students think and feel, what's actually going on. And what I wanted to reflect on, um, which will be very brief, just to start us off, is the sense of optimism that I really have about change right now in, in this area. Um, we know that strategically we are approaching this together. We have organisations across the sector working together and we have a strategic framework and we will have come December the 9th when we publish the Charter's um, document, we will have comprehensive information about all areas of, um, of the whole university approach to mental health. Um, so I feel very optimistic that things are moving in the right direction. Um, and I think what I wanted to highlight really is what, when we talk about whole university approach to mental health, I think we just need to keep defining, keep exploring what we mean by that. So we need to be talking about transitions in from school and college, um, but the progression through university towards a transition out. Um, we need to be thinking about having excellent services that are well resourced, that are accessible, that have good governance behind them, both in our universities and in the NHS. We need to think about that relationship, but we need to be careful. We, we so want to be able to say, this is where the boundary is. This is and, and do you know what? Mental health is not that straightforward. It is not this case of, we do this, we hand over here. We need to think about, about boundaries, and we think, need to think about overlapping boundaries. Um, we need to think about both students and staff. So I think that's, that point's been well made, but for us with the Charter, just to reiterate, this is not actually Student Mental Health Charter, this is University Mental Health Charter, recognising you cannot think about one without the other. 
We need to think about the environment, where you live, your home, the design of your buildings, all of these elements come together. So I, I know that, that we're doing some work here to build on this picture, but I feel very optimistic because I feel that when you're trying to create, you look at social change theory, when you're trying to create change on an issue, lots of things are now lining up. So we have this, the frameworks that we've mentioned. We have lots of organisations now playing a role in helping and supporting um, universities through that change. We have so much expertise on our own campuses. So I know how many brilliant mental health practitioners there are working on university campuses. I know how many leaders there are now that are stepping up to say, we are going to make this a strategic priority. Um, and we know that students can drive this as well. This new generation are different. They are purpose-led. They see the problems in the world and they want to make change happen. And we can, we can work together on that. Um, we're also, as, as Paul mentioned, thinking about this much more inclusively as well. So um, brilliant report that came out from OFS this week. Um, I want to particularly highlight LGBTQ plus students. We did a piece of work last year which researched LGBT students' experiences. Um, there is a really nice flow through into the afternoon session that's going on because we absolutely have to talk about trauma, we have to talk about discrimination, we have to really acknowledge the root causes and factors that are driving some of this. Um, so that's kind of our uh, stop there with my kind of ramble of, uh, this morning, but I really want to just, the last thing I want to say is let's start also telling some more of these positive stories. The students that you heard at the start really started to share with us some of the real blocks, some of the barriers which we absolutely need to address. I think we also need to start celebrating and hearing some of the positive stories of students and staff. When we get this right, when people get timely access to support when they need it, when we create healthy environments where people can genuinely thrive, we have so much potential for this sector to be back regarded as it should be, as a brilliant, brilliant sector of brilliant minds who want to do good. That's, that'll be my two pence for now. <laughs> Thank you, Rosie. Mary, you happy to... Thank you very much. And um, wow, how do you follow that? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, 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 I'm really pleased that Paul highlighted the fact that this is uh, a continuum and that we all, at some point in our life, may experience some kind of mental unwellness. Um, and we know people in our communities, amongst our friendship groups, perhaps in our families, who have had mental health challenges and issues. And I think we've just got to recognize that this is not something that's separate and over there. Mm -hmm. This is part of our lives. And when we ask that question, is it campus or community, like Paul and like Rosie, I'm going to say it's absolutely both. The place that I come from at the University of Lincoln, we talk about ourselves being one community. In fact, we're a community within a community, and that's how we try to approach things. Um, this is, this is a, a, a challenge that actually I don't believe we'll ever get absolutely right. We have to constantly be challenging ourselves and constantly looking at our practice. So anything I say now is contingent, and I think won't be what we'll be doing next year necessarily, because we'll have learned some more and got better. So I, I want to um, start with a, a, a story which I hope will illustrate something of that community focus. So it's a, a Tuesday morning on our campus. It's busy. Now, those of you who work in the sector, what is it about Tuesday mornings? <laughs> they are always so busy. It seems to be a really important time for students and staff to be running around the campus. It's one of those Tuesday mornings. A member of my staff is walking across from one building to another, and there are a whole range of students all around walking around. She notices a young woman who has blood trickling down her arm. She's late for a meeting, but she stops the student and says, have you hurt yourself? And the young woman replies, yes. So my member of staff turns to her and says, would you like me 
to take you to someone who could help you? And the young woman replies, yes. <coughs> so my member of staff takes her to the Student Wellbeing Centre where she is met and supported by the team there. She then speaks to my member of staff and says, you know, I walked past this building yesterday when I knew I wanted to cut myself, but I was too afraid to come in. Thank you for bringing me in. Now that story, I think, illustrates the community aspect of what we are trying to promote at Lincoln. And by that, as Rosie says, we have the most fabulous professional staff who don't always live in that building, who do go out, who do connect with students, who do have a very heavy caseload <laughs> if they are counsellors, who do a wide variety of different things. But it is vital that other members of our community, other members of our staff, and indeed our students, have some level of training and know it is their responsibility to look out for students and staff in distress. It's a community responsibility. And we use a wide variety of different things to do that. We um, provide specific training, not only in signposting, but also in helping people, if they have someone with significant distress, to take them to a service. Signposting's fine, but if someone is unwell, they need support to get there. So the training has to do all of that. We also monitor attendance and we have engagement markers which enable us to begin to get a sense of what might be <coughs> indicators where we need to place specific attention. Now I'd be very interested in hearing from Peter in a bit because they've done quite a bit of work on this and we need to learn from them. But beyond the work that we do within the university, we have established a partnership which goes widely across our community, not just our internal campus community. Because even though we have excellent professionals, we do not have the level of skill and knowledge that people in the NHS have. And our students are in that wider community, so they are going to come in contact with um, blue light services. In that transition into university, they'll be in schools and colleges. They may move between us and our sister institution in our city. So we have a very broad community partnership, which now has um, a data sharing agreement, which means that if our students do go to the mental health crisis team, we will be told how to support them once they come back. This is an amazing achievement, and it's down to my head of uh, student well-being. Because not <coughs> only is she a brilliant professional, but she's got the most amazing networking skills and knows how to build partnerships. So, you know, this is... This is really not about me. It's about my wonderful, wonderful team that I have and our fabulous students. The final thing I'll end with in terms of, of student empowerment in this space, I have a wonderful member of staff called Tom Wright who is um, responsible for digital student life. It's a fabulous term, I think. Um, but Tom uh, works with students to develop on all various forms of social media. Their way of communicating with other students about all the issues that they think are really important. And that's another aspect to how we work as a community. I'll shut up at that point. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Um, that was really insightful. Um, 
And so would you like to um, yeah. introduce yourself? <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. So I'm Peter Francis and I'm from Northumbria University. It seems to me that there's the, a the number of themes that have come out of, of here. First of all is, is that universities are in the business of transforming lives and, and all of us in, that, in, in this room know that that is what we're about. But actually we have one key asset and it's not shiny buildings or, or glass top things or that, it's people. The things that universities have are people, our staff and our students. And if you take either of those out of what we do, we actually don't have much to offer. And so what we need is really strong, really resilient, powerful, transformative people themselves who are delivering um, that university and, and acting as great ambassadors for our university. Great students, empowered students, great staff, empowered staff. That means health and well-being is central to the strategy of any university. But our core business is research, education and knowledge exchange. But we can't deliver any of that, as I say, without really good people. And people who are healthy, happy and engaged are crucial to what we deliver. And like Mary, I have some stories that, that I could tell if we had longer, but I will just talk about, about one. Over the last three or four years, I've been involved in, in leading a, a project looking at the way in which we can use data to better understand our students, and better understand um, what they're doing and how they're doing it. And key, really, is thinking about the iceberg. Because what Paul's talked about and what Mary and Rose have identified is there's, there's only so much we know in relation to mental health and well-being. And what we ultimately know is that which comes to the surface, either because it's self-referred <coughs> or because one of us or our colleagues or other students refer to the institution. And over the course of the last two or three years, I've been running a project looking at the way in which um, we could deliver better retention within the student body by using their data. Opted in and engaged and fully briefed in relation to what it was. The story really is, two or three years ago, I've always sent out emails to students, the Deputy Vice Chancellor saying, welcome, etc. my colleagues have, and we do it through freshmen all the way through the years. No one's ever replied. Why would they? Over the last two years, I've sent out segmented emails, personalised, from myself um, to a, a range of students. Instead of one um, email at the beginning of term, somewhere in the region of 60 to 80 to 100 to 120, depending upon how we've segmented those students and the information and data that we have for them. Two or three years ago, I started to get students writing back to me. Writing back to me about saying that they're looking forward to the institution, looking forward to the opportunity, or looking forward to coming back. Some students started to tell me about their health and their well-being. Some students started to tell me about things that had gone on in their lives. And when my colleagues started to do the same sort of thing, students started to present themselves in ways that we'd never, ever seen in the institution before. I had one student that wrote to me and said, this is an absolutely lovely email. I really appreciate it. It's a shame it's automated. <laughs> we wrote back to him within 20 seconds. He's now um, been through our counselling services. I won't tell you what um, else his, his email said. A number of other students have started to um, present themselves in different ways ways and, and, and different what means to the institution. And, and there's two bits to this that I just want to sort of highlight. The first one was that we, said we segmented and sent out information to our students two weeks before they started. Before they even started, we had students enrolling in our counselling and mental health services as a consequence of, first of all, that we were able to segment them and target them, and secondly, that we were able to um, engage with them through our, uh, what we'd offered. The second one was up to assessment. We again nudged students in very different ways, whether, were, whether we perceived them as thriving or striving or, or surviving in different ways based upon their data profile. Our requests for assessment training, skills saves, training and counselling at that time <coughs> was fourfold increase. We had to put on different sessions in the day and the evening. Now, actually very, very simple. And the project I'm leading at the moment for the OFS is the extent to which you can transform student lives by taking the concept that we've done, 
we're actually then starting to think of it in the context of mental health and well-being. And running alongside that, I've sponsored a project in my institution that has moved away from talking about mental health and talking about student life and well-being. And so we've introduced a student life and well-being um, strategy, which starts from the premise that Paul talked very powerfully about thriving. Actually, my worry is that we often have a deficit model which is risk-based when we start out. The starting point for me in this debate is how do institutions create thriving communities, engaged and empowered student bodies, that acknowledges that it's a fluid continuum whereby students may strive, they may survive, and they may thrive over the course of the week, depending upon a range of activities that they've been engaged in. But actually, culturally, the starting point for our ambitions and our, um, our activities should be the sense of how do we create thriving communities. And within that context, then, how do we create communities of thriving staff? Staff who wish to work for the institution, staff who see the institution as be providing them with more than just an opportunity to work and engage. Because ultimately, I've spent five minutes talking to you about data and the way in which I will work with the OFS and, and, and my project teams to deliver a, a complete transformation of the way in which universities deliver data. But actually, my project is about relationships. It's actually about looking at how do you bring students and the university much closer together? How do you do it in a personalized environment? whereby students feel that they have a name, that they have a place, and they have an, act, an engagement, and a special engagement with academic and professional support staff. And I think that's my real message from today, is we can do lots and lots, but it's actually quite an easy offer. It's about developing strong, coherent, and lasting relationships from before students join the institution to way beyond they leave the institution. And that, to me, is the transformative effect of higher education. Ah, thank you very much for that. And we've already heard from Paul Farmer today, so I'd like to, yeah, not, not to count you out or anything, <laughs> um, I'd like to start the discussion, actually, by asking a question myself, if that's all right, and then we'll hand over to you as the audience. Um, so my first question is kind of about going back to the campus and community aspect that Paul was talking about earlier. Um, what is university's role and how far should they go in supporting students with their mental health? So, shall I, shall I, shall I start? So, so, just very briefly, I mean, just to kind of reiterate, I suppose, uh, my point, I think, and listening to the really uh, great contributions, I think, so, so for me, there is a, uh, there's a role for, uh, there's absolutely clearly a role for universities in supporting students from start to finish, and that's what all the, the three of you have all said very clearly at various points in their university journey. Uh, but it's probably not something that you're going to, that all universities are going to do on their own. So they do need effective partnerships with the NHS in particular, but not just with the NHS, with other, with uh, possibly sometimes with schools, sometimes with future employers. There's a kind of all part of that kind of continuum and with the communities where students are living. So, so but, but I do think that there's a centrality about the fact that people are in a, often in a particular place because they are at university. That means that the university does clearly have a responsibility for their, those individuals. And clearly there's legal, there's duty of care responsibilities, but there are also kind of ethical and moral responsibilities, which is probably where the debate is at its most strong, because we're still trying to work out exactly the fine line. But if you, if, you know, if you, Peter feels that he's going to, he wants to personalise every single email to every single student, essentially, it's not quite what he's saying, but you're to groups of students, then that is rooted in a real commitment from university leaders that says, we take the, the health and well-being of our people really seriously. And that has to be the kind of, that's the top, that's the top message, I think, that taking the health and well-being of your student population has got to be a priority for the leadership of every university. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything to add on that? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just, I agree entirely with, with Paul that it's very, very much about, it's a joint responsibility between ourselves as an institution, taking strategic responsibility, and also the organisations that, that work around. But the difficulty, I think, is that universities don't know enough mm -hmm. about how to do it. And it's a very simple set of questions that, 
that we need to address. What do we do with our students that live out with the region? What is their relationship to our services and how do we engage with them vis-a-vis -vis the services that they have back at home which are they much more engaged in? So 50% of my students come from within the northeast region. The relationship that I have and they have with their services and the institution is very different than those students that come from London and the type of activity that they wish to receive from myself. So in these <laughs> counselling services from the institution, you'll see it's mostly Northeast students. Because often students that present themselves with, with difficulties often are engaged out with the, the institution back at home and services. So, so for us, we're starting to understand that issue, but we're nowhere near um, getting into detail. So for me, it's about the responsibility. We have a very clear strategic responsibility as an institution. We talk a lot across the sector about teaching and learning plans. I think every student should have a well-being plan when they join the institution. And that well-being plan is about, about the mental and the physical aspects of their, their three years, two years, one year, four years that they'll spend in the institution. And I think it's something that's co-created with the institution and, and the students as they come in. And it's an iterative um, plan that works through it. So we have a clear strategic responsibility because people are at the core, but there are a lot of difficulties and complexities of that, and that is the minute the institutions look outside of their boundary and start to work with the services, because it's very easy to say those services are on the doorstep, but for many students, they're nowhere near the doorstep, many are overseas. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think if um, you, you as, as, as a leader do not create the framework which enables your community uh, to work with them, you, you're not doing your job. So um, it, it's, it's not that I think that things should be top down. Actually, I don't. I think in universities, top down doesn't really work. But a framework which everyone in the community has contributed to, staff and students, which is this is, this is how we want to work as a community, um, uh, gets a lot more buy-in and, and is, is something that's both values-driven, and I think this, this area needs to be absolutely values-driven um, about inclusivity and about equality um, uh, for, for students, because otherwise students will not learn. And, you know, if this is the, 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 the way I've communicated it to my academic colleagues is, you know, many academics come into higher education um, and say, but I'm not trained in this. this. This wasn't why I came into higher education. I came to teach or I came to do research. And, and you know, you have to engage with them and actually say, well, you know, A, this is part of life. This is not separate. Um, but B, if you want your students to learn, you have to create an environment in which they can learn effectively. And creating a community focus around saying, you know, sometimes people will not be so well and we need to understand what we can do to help them um, in that context. I really like the notion of thriving. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important. Yeah. Yeah. I'll just briefly add that I think, um, I suppose asking the question of how far we should go, I would say <coughs> we should think a bit more of how far can we go and what is the potential here. And if you look at kind of a more public health approach, you think about the opportunity that we have in these yeah, environments. Um, so I would just sort of flip the thinking a bit on that. And what I would say is I think the sector are really asking, though, for better clarity around things like boundaries. And we've heard that really well throughout the charter consultation. So that's a whole lot of data we've got. You know, over um, 170 focus groups, an online survey, um, all this information, not least the input of organisations that are really um, integrated in this space, so working very closely with the UK, NUS, and Moshi, um, both Office for Students and UBP Foundation as previously funding supporting that, um, and the Department for Education. So there's kind of like quite a lot of insight there, I guess. Um, so I think from what's come through the consultation, I know people are asking for that clarity and I guess I hope that when this document comes out it seeks to really put some lines in the sand around this is what we think should be the principle for these different areas but still allows for that constant improvement which is what's going to be needed. It's not going to be 
right, here we go, this is everything we need to do. It's going to be, here's what we know now, because mm. we have, we do know a lot. Mm. So this is the thing, with my research brain, I'm going, yes, we know we need to find out more, and that's why we're the, a partner in Smarter, but we do know a lot already. Mm. We, there mm. are lots of things we can draw on now. Um, and the final thing I'd say is just about the NHS relationship. Um, that working with UK, UE, the lead institution, there's some really fantastic work going on funded by the RFS to look at what is, how do you get that relationship right across the city? You know, um, get that, that transition from university services, NHS services, build those relationships. So I think we'll have hopefully some good practice to share from that as well. Oh, thank you so much. I think there's some really positive kind of um, examples of where we are doing things as a sector and we are building on the evidence base that we have and we're trying to make things better. I would now like to open questions up to the audience. So does anyone have a question they would like to ask? Lots of hands. This gentleman over here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Chris Shell at University of Greenwich. I just want to say thank you for the positive comments, Rosie. As you know, it's uh, one of my bugbears that we don't um, uh, celebrate the good things that we do. And I think as a sector, we beat ourselves up and allow ourselves to be beaten up quite a lot for um, not doing enough, not working hard enough, when actually we are doing an awful lot. And if we compare ourselves to wider society, actually students have got access to an awful lot more than probably any, in many, if not any other sectors. Um, but that said, Mary's example is a really pertinent one of the student who knew full well that the wellbeing service was there but didn't access it until they were physically taken in. And we all talk about better signposting and better um, you know, access to services and, and reducing the stigma. But actually quite a lot of our students say, I know I've got a condition or I know I've got an issue. I know you've got services but I'm choosing not to access your service because I, I'm scared about what that means for declaring an issue to my institution in terms of the impact on my degree. Now that is more prevalent with fitness to practice, but it actually affects all students. Quite a lot of them just say, I didn't want to tell you, I didn't want to ask for help from you because I didn't know what that was going to mean for the rest of my degree. So my question is, how can we really break through that stigma? It's not about you know, just better signposting and, and, and better communication. There's got to be something there that is really stopping our students from trusting us, actually, to provide the appropriate support and for it to not impact directly on their studies. So, I mean, I, I think you're absolutely right, and that's why I gave that, that illustration. Um, it, it, it seems to me you just have to open up the debate and, 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 and normalize the fact that people have different issues and that we are, are, are differently empowered. Actually, you can learn a lot from going through um, a, a bout of, of, of mental illness. You can learn a lot that actually you can bring back to your community. Um, so, okay. Uh, when when I was um, when I when I had my twins, I was made homeless. I was living in a homeless hostel for families. Um, I was quite unwell. I learned a hell of a lot through that process. Things that stay with me and have taught me that I have more resilience than an awful lot of people around me. And you know, that's what going through a bout of mental illness can actually do to you. It's something that, that we, that's what you mean by celebrating. It's not so much celebrating that we do great things. We do do great things. But it's celebrating what difference can bring to a community. That's what we've got to do, and that's what we've got to open up. And then actually, I think people will be much more prepared to talk, to access services, to learn from each other in that context. Well, I was going to so think the, the question for me is to what extent, you know, picking up Mary's point, but to what extent does it need to be engaging in the curriculum as well? So if you go to America, there are many institutions over there that have very clear uh, health and well-being aspects as part of the curriculum. My sense is culturally we can hope or we can do something really significant about it. And, and I think that certainly at year one, we need to rethink how we transition and onboard students into um, universities, what the role of that, that is, and, and what we are attempting to do about it. It's often too content-driven, 
and it's not often yeah. not about some of the real issues that we want to address in terms of um, preparing for later life, preparing for, 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 for uh, you know, lifelong learning. So for me, I would advocate yeah. some form of formal curricular engagement in all aspects of health, mental, physical well-being that, that sits right at the beginning of, of how we onboard and engage. And that's something that I would take from schools into the university. I, I think so very quickly, Anna, I think your question is about how do you, is about disclosure and how do you get people to be more open to you as a university about their own experiences? And this is a huge, this is a big problem everywhere. So the, the employers have exactly the same problem, despite the fact that actually people have greater legal protection from the actual act of disclosure. And I think what we've learned from employers is you do you kind of have to find points in time when people feel more or less so sometimes just after you've got the, you've been given a job offer i.e. in this context maybe after just after you've been offered a place you feel very well disposed towards the institution you're more likely to be more open secondly once you've got yourself established in that environment you're more well, you're more likely to disclose your experiences but you have to give people opportunities mm. to disclose mm. and um, Channel 4 did this with their staff uh, they, they as you know they're a brilliant Paralympic broadcaster and they looked at their staff and they surveyed their staff and they have four percent of their staff had disabilities and they they didn't really believe it so they made it they did what they do well they made a load of films about people with men, with non-visible disabilities mainly main not just mental health issues uh, and their disclosure and then they asked people to disclose and their disclosure rate went up to 11 percent of their staff with very small amounts of turnover so you can but you think you have to kind of encourage the openness and i think it's the openness of people that helps to drive that including the openness optimally of the people who use your services which is a hard ask because often people don't want to say they've even been to use the service let alone talk about how good it's been but that's that's one of the keys to it and the question for you though the link to that is, is whether it's about disclosure to service or whether it's about much greater understanding and transparency of so my sense is the range of, of, of options part of it is curricular based part of it is about asking before students engage part of it is in the way in which we've demonstrated today are nudges but but it's actually about making it not a taboo subject but actually something which is a positive element of, of what a transformative organization is about we're made up of lots of different people all with lots of different uh, backgrounds and so on and so forth that's the culture that we inspire to create and so what we want to do is create reflexivity within it in my sense is you've got to do some quite significant work mm. to get that to come because students nor many of us in this room will disclose if we don't have the opportunity, formally or informally. Thank you. I think we've got time for another question. Um, that, gent that lady at the back there? Just to your left. I can't tell my left or right. <laughs> Hi. Um, yeah, so I'm Nakasi. I'm a PhD student at King's College London. Um, I've just given a little introduction. I'm also uh, the founder of a student-led organisation known as Student of Colour Collective. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to be here, um, but my question um, is about um, ethnicity, and um, as I think it was mentioned at the beginning, we know that ethnicity plays a role in mental health for university students, um, but I kind of have the question of how you guys think it's best to engage students of colour um, to kind of get involved in these kind of conversations um, and to capture their experiences um, at university, because I think that's one thing that's kind of missing um, and what interventions they would need. So that's kind of what my question is about. Because um, I guess, as you can see, there's a bit of a lack of diversity in this kind of setting, mm -hmm. which is a shame. Um, and I guess that represents as well, I think, the university situation. So yeah, that was my question. Are you happy to? Yeah, I think very fair challenge there. Um, I think something that we're trying to really encourage is genuine authentic co-production throughout everything and i think people's understanding of co-production can be quite different and when and when are you actually consulting somebody <coughs> and when are you actually um empowering someone to be a decision maker um, so i think throughout all of this work it's really crucial that that is embedded um, I can speak from some of our experiences. I know it's something for us as a charity is absolutely 
a, a key objective for us this year. Um, it has to be labelled, it has to be called, it has to be directly said. Um, so it's not good enough to just keep saying, we know this needs to be improved upon. Like, it has to be in there as a priority that you're going to measure yourself against um, to improve that um, <coughs> engagement and leadership. Um, so that, that's part of it. But I think, yeah, it's co-production. I mean, we're really grateful that to have been able to work with NUS for the charter to give some challenge to really uh, help us build in some um, workshops and specific situations that um, are directly actually saying we want to open up that conversation around race and mental health. And um, we worked with some students at um, Westminster recently who did an event which was for Black History Month saying let's talk about race and mental health and that was completely shaped by those students working collaboratively with support. So I think, I think yeah, I'm, I think it's spot on question and I think we should have much more time to talk about it and actually you'll, I think perhaps a suggestion that a panel specifically focused around that as well at a future event would be brilliant. I think, yeah, I think that's all, unfortunately, we have time for. Um, but we all, I think we're all sticking around today, so if you do have any questions for us, then please do find us and feel free to ask them. Um, and thank you very much to our panel today for their expertise and their contribution to today's event. It's been really insightful.